welcome to this video tutorial in which we're going to be doing some A-level law revision on the topic of negligence in tort. And in this particular video, we're going to be taking a look at some revision flowcharts, which show the three key elements that you need to prove in order to be successful in a claim of negligence, duty of care, breach of duty and damage. Before we look at the flow charts, let's remind ourselves of the key elements that we're looking for. So in the tort of negligence, civil liability is based on establishing three principles, duty of care, breach of duty and damage. And once all of these principles have been established, compensation may be paid out to our claimant, which aims to put them back into the position that they would have been in before the damage occurred. And I'm sure you all recognise the image here on the slide. This is depicting the facts of the very famous case of Donoghue and Stevenson, 1932, which created the modern law of negligence. So what happened here was that Mrs Donoghue went to a cafe with her friend and her friend bought her a bottle of ginger beer that was in a brown opaque bottle so that the contents couldn't be seen. And Mrs Donoghue drank most of the ginger beer and then when she got towards the end of the bottle she poured the remaining ginger beer into a glass and the remains of a decomposing snail fell out. Um, and Mrs Donoghue suffered personal injury, gastroenteritis, and she commenced a claim against the manufacturer of the ginger beer. And the reason she did that was that back then, the law on privity meant that because her friend had bought her the bottle, she didn't have an action in contract. So she was suing the manufacturer of the ginger beer. And her claim in the House of Lords was successful, and this case established the modern law of negligence and the neighbour test, where Lord Atkin um, made his very famous speech, where he talked about the fact that you must take reasonable care to avoid acts or omissions which you can reasonably foresee would likely to be injure, would likely to injure your neighbour, sorry. So what we'll do now is take a look at these three elements um, of negligence that we need to prove one by one, starting with duty of care. So here's the first of our three flowcharts. This one is on duty of care and we'll get on to breach of duty and damage. But you can see they're just a nice visual representation of the law on these three elements of negligence and they can be really helpful for revision and checking that you understand your cases. And you can see that I've got some key cases on the bottom here with ticks or crosses depending on whether liability was found or was not found. And that can just be really helpful in jogging your memory. So duty of care, we start with the Donoghue and Stevenson case that we've just mentioned. So the test for duty of care, we start with the neighbour principle and that comes from Lord Atkins famous statement where he said that you must take reasonable care to avoid acts and omissions that you can reasonably foresee are likely to injure your neighbour. And that's why it's called the neighbour principle. But that test was very vague, so it was further developed by the case of Caparo and Dickman, which gave us this handy three stage test for determining when a duty of care would be found. So it must be reasonably foreseeable, there must be sufficient proximity between the parties and it must be fair, just and reasonable in all the circumstances to impose the duty. And the first two tests, reasonably foreseeable and proximity, actually come from the wording of the, the neighbour test from Lord Atkin. The third one, fair, just and reasonable, this one is also referred to as a public policy test. And some people say it's a bit like um, a safety valve for judicial discretion. So it's just a way of cut the courts limiting liability in particular areas on the grounds of public policy. So the first thing to show is that it was reasonably foreseeable that our claimant would suffer harm as a result of the defendant's acts or omissions. And in the case of Kent and Griffiths, 
it was reasonably foreseeable that if an ambulance took a very long time to come, the claimant would suffer further harm. And it's always nice to contrast that with a case where it was not reasonably foreseeable. So in Ball Hill and Young, it was not foreseeable that a pregnant woman would suffer a stillbirth when she heard, although she didn't even really see, only the aftermath of a motorbike accident. It was not reasonably foreseeable. There wasn't proximity between the parties either. And sometimes your cases will fit into more than one of these tests. And of course, you can use them to illustrate more than one point in the exam. And for proximity, we need to show that there was a proximate relationship between the defendant and the claimant. And that can be um, a relationship that is physically close in terms of time and space. And you could use Home Office and Dorset Yacht to make that point. Or there could be proximity through a legal relationship, such as that shown in the case of Osman and Ferguson. But again, it's nice to contrast with a case where there was not proximity. So Hill and the Chief Constable of West Yorkshire is a case on that, where there wasn't sufficient proximity between the police and the claimant and the claimant was the mother of the last victim of the, the Yorkshire Ripper. Um, and there wasn't sufficient proximity there because there was no way that the police could have known who the last victim would be. And then, as I've said, we've got the public policy test. Is it fair, just and reasonable? And this is where traditionally the courts have said that it's not fair, just and reasonable to impose a duty of care on a public service acting in an emergency. And again, you can see the same case of Hill being used there. It can be used to illustrate both points. But of course, we would want to contrast that with the recent and very important case of Robinson, where it was found that the police had been negligent um, when they actually landed on the victim, on our claimant, when they were actually trying to apprehend other people. So that's interesting because it has shown that the courts can be prepared to impose a duty on the police when acting in an emergency. Um, so it's always going to be decided on the facts. So there's our little reminder of duty of care. Let's move on to breach of duty. Proving that a duty of care exists is not enough. We now have to show that once the duty was owed, our defendant breached that duty and that they breached that duty by falling below the standard expected of the reasonable man. And the reasonable man test comes from the case of Blythe and Birmingham Waterworks. And this reasonable man test is an objective test and we need to meet the standard of the reasonable man. However, that test is variable depending on circumstances of the particular defendant. So that's where our flow chart goes here. So characteristics of the defendant and also risk factors in the situation can also alter the standard. So depending on whether any of these characteristics or risk factors apply will affect whether the standard expected is raised, so we expect more, or the standard expected is lowered, we maybe expect a little less. And that will depend on the facts of the case. So if we consider particular characteristics of the defendant to start with, um, these are some important areas to consider when you're looking at a scenario. So with children, these were this was the case where children were fencing with a plastic ruler and it snapped and went into one of the children's eyes. It was held that children owe the standard of care of another child of that age. So we wouldn't expect a nine year old child to meet the standard of the reasonable man. We would expect them to meet the standard of a reasonable nine year old. The next important situation is that the defendant may be a learner, such as a learner driver, but it would also um, you could apply this learner situation to if you've got a scenario where it's saying something like Lucy's only been a doctor for three weeks or so and so is a junior. 
So this learner principle doesn't just apply to drivers. Um, but the learner situation comes from the case of Nettleship and Weston. And it's sometimes seen as quite a surprising principle. But a learner is expected to meet the same standard of an experienced person. So learners owe the same duty as a competent driver. We don't lower the standard for learners. And the Bolam test here gives us a test that we use for experts. So where there's divided opinion within a profession as to the appropriate course of action in a particular situation, then a defendant is not going to be in breach of duty if they've followed um, one body of opinion rather than another. And that comes from Bolam. So let's consider risk factors then. So the courts will start by considering the likelihood of harm. So how likely was it that harm could have um, occurred in this situation? In other words, was it a low risk or a high risk activity? The defendant isn't expected to guard against risks which cannot be foreseen at all. And you could use Rowan Minister of Health there. Um, if it's a low risk activity, Bolton and Stone is a case you could use there. Um, then the defendant is not expected to take extra care if it's low risk in that way. However, is if it's high risk, such as Haley and the London Electricity Board involving um, the blind claimant that fell into a hole that had been left um, by the council. If it's high risk, then we're going to expect our defendants to take more care. And the courts will also consider the magnitude of the harm. So in Paris and Stepney, our claimant was already blind in one eye before he started working at the mechanics. Um, and he wasn't provided safety goggles. And because he was already blind in one eye, the magnitude of the potential harm to him, should something go into his good eye, was so significant that even more risk, um, even more care, sorry, should have been taken. And you can link this case quite nicely to practicality of taking precautions, because the magnitude of the harm was high in, in Paris and Stepney. And the cost of actually reducing that risk was low. It wouldn't have taken much. It doesn't cost much to buy safety goggles. So these two are linked to the magnitude of the harm and the practicality of taking precautions or the cost of prevention. Um, and remember in Latimer, this was where there was um, a water spillage in a factory and there had been sawdust and signs put up. Someone still fell over. But that court, court case gave the reasonable, the logical decision that we don't have to take every possible precaution. You just have to take reasonable precautions depending on the magnitude of the harm, the size of the risk, etc. And we also consider the potential benefits of the risky activity or the utility of the defendant's conduct. So in what in Hertfordshire, because the defendant was trying to save a life, they were entitled to take more risks because of the utility, the importance in their activity. So that's breach of duty. Let's move on to the final stage in proving negligence. Our last stage is damage. Um, and to prove damage, we are looking at factual causation and legal causation or remoteness of damage. So just proving duty of care and breach of duty is not enough. The final stage is proving damage. And to demonstrate causation in tort law, the claimant must establish that the loss they've suffered was caused by the defendant. And we always start off with factual causation using the but for test. And the but for test comes from the case of Barnett and Chelsea Kensington Hospital. And it says, but for the defendant's actions, would the claimant have suffered the loss? If yes, the defendant is not liable because it would have happened anyway. If no, the defendant has passed that stage and is liable. However, there are problems in proving causation um, and proving the but-for test when there are multiple causes 
that could explain how the harm occurred. So Wilshire and Essex was a case where there was a premature baby that had been given too much oxygen and he went blind. But there were five other possible causes of the blindness aside from the excess oxygen. So where there are two or more causes which operate concurrently, it can be factually impossible to determine which one was the cause. And this is problematic because it's the claimant's responsibility to establish which one was the cause. And on general principles, the burden of proving this is on the balance of probabilities. The claimant has to demonstrate that there was more than a 50% likelihood of the cause um, being the breach of duty um, of the defendant. Where there are two causes, this means that the burden of proof is impossible to discharge, leaving the claimant uncompensated, even though there's an obvious breach of duty. Um, so this is a, a controversial area, something that you could talk about if you're evaluating the law on negligence, how difficult it can potentially be, particularly to prove medical negligence. We also may have an issue with a novus actus interveniens or a new intervening act. And where there is a new intervening act between the defendant's negligent act and the consequence, this may break the chain of causation, removing liability from the defendant. And the legal test applicable will depend upon whether the new act was that of a third party or the act of a claimant. Um, and you can use the case of Smith and Littlewoods on that. And once we've proven factual causation, we then need to prove legal causation of, um, sorry, or remoteness of damage. And that comes from the case of the wagon mound. And in the wagon mound, it was held that the test is whether the damage is of a kind that was foreseeable. And if a foreseeable type of damage is present, the defendant is liable for the full extent of the damage, no matter whether the extent of the damage itself was foreseeable. And you've got a few cases that you can use to talk about foreseeability of damage. So Crossley and Rawlinson was where our claimant was injured on the way to the danger. He was running with a fire extinguisher and was injured on his way there. Um, and that was not reasonably foreseeable. Bradford and Robinson Rentals help to make, helps to make that last point that I mentioned, that if it's a foreseeable type of damage, the defendant's liable for the full extent of the damage, even though the extent of the damage um, was foreseeable or not. So in Bradford and Robinson Rentals, he got frostbite when he was driving in a lorry in winter that didn't have heaters. And because it was an injury that was of the type that's reasonably foreseeable, i.e. from being cold, the fact that it was a very extreme injury caused by being cold was irrelevant or defendants liable for the full extent of it. You can talk about unusual causes of the harm, Hughes and Lord Advocate, where the boys went down a hole with a paraffin lamp. Um, and the thin school rule is also important, often creeps up um, or often pops up, I should say, in scenario type questions. Um, you have to take your victim as you find them. And you could talk about Smith and Leach brain. That was where some molten metal um, went onto our claimant's lip and triggered off um, latent cancer that our victim or our claimant, I should say, um, was suffering. And our defendant had to take his victim as he found him, thin school rule. And finally, I've put it down at the bottom here, um, just to bear in mind, recips are loquitur, other things speaks for itself. That's a bit rarer, but it can crop up um, in negligence questions as well. So I hope this video has been useful to you in just um, illustrating or depicting the law of negligence in different ways using flow charts. And I hope that's been useful for your revision. Remember that I do have other videos on my channel on negligence that go through all the law in detail if you feel you need a refresher on the cases themselves in more detail.